office and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he sat at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every aspect, now this comes down to us in the fact that he shares our humanity completely, but yet there was no tendency to sin. However, within our body, he knew all its capacity, and having created us, he knew what it could do. And so it is that, though perfectly God and perfectly man, he is on side with regard to his creatures, and who better than he to sympathize therewith. And we find this happening in the Gospel itself. We find that he wants to come out and reach out to those who are beyond the pale. Follow me, he says, to the most unexpected candidate. It could be our case as well. There are calls, there are words that do reach unexpected souls. I remember actually a powerful sermon when a child on this very verse. It was in Sabashin, and the preacher, a young man, indicated how the Lord did call, and I thought, while watching his future life as a young, dedicated preacher, how beautiful actually it was to give one's life 
to proclaiming the word from pulpit to pulpit all over Wales. And this Levi was called, therefore, and of course there is this reaction from officialdom. The Lord is eating with those who are beyond redemption. And also, if we're honest, it could be our mental reaction at times. We tend, if we are true to ourselves, to want to be, as it were, a little bit different. We don't accept that others take our place. And so it is that we judge others according to our categories, and our judgments are very far off the mark. A true judgment would be a withholding of judgment, for we do not know, and also a seeing of the potentiality of the soul. The Lord saw what Levi could do, and indeed with time he did it. He gave us the first gospel, and he also gave us witness, even unto death, martyrdom. And here we see the Lord rejoicing in the gift of redemption received by those who are grateful and humble. On the other hand, we have the officials complaining. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They are officially sinners. And then, of course, this dig, and it's not clear whether they perceived it as such. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And here we are, head on. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Did they perceive what was being said to them? I often think of the way that grace is reaches people in unexpected situations. One thinks, for instance, of those who have gone in their droves to places like Medjugorje and have come back changed. I have heard many testimonies of things happening there, a complete U-turn. One thinks of the likes of Ray, who became really an apostle for Our Lady in this area, who died at the age of 39 petering out in hospital, but still bearing witness in the hospital ward. And as he was that night about to watch the mass of his dear grandmother, whose birthday it would be today, Emily, Emily Kane, he was singing in her ear the hymn that he loved very much and that she loved very much, Our Lady of Knock. And it happens that sometimes souls, as it were, come for each other, for he died at that moment, and it seems that she came for him, so to speak. A year later, exactly on the same feast day of Our Lady of Knock. But he was an example of someone who, unlike the earlier generation, would have had to be fished. His grandmother would have been of the generation of great faith. She was married in 1954, a marrying year. They were remembering what happened in 1854. The proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception it was also four years after the proclamation of the dogma of the Assumption. And she would have been one of those truly Marian souls, kept safe by the faith of the Irish a generation which is petering out more and more, leaving us with a syncretism of religion. New age, a bit of this and a bit of that. Spirituality is so-called. But where is the dogma that was strong in their life? One may criticise the way that things were done, but they were done. Now they seem to be not done at all, which is better. Again, judgment of those who have gone before us, as though we were the first to get it right. This throwing of stones, this element of judging others, entrenchment, camps, internal disputes, infighting in the church, is not the best way of spending a Christian life on earth. On that level, things were more serene in a harder Ireland. Life was hard. The faith was simple and strong, and it got them to heaven. Now we're quite 
uncertain where these people end up. Many take their own lives, many ruin them with drugs, and yet they're given a brilliant send-off when it comes to their funeral, automatic beatification. Nevertheless, there are these gems, and I often think of the way that, in tears, we were singing that hymn, Our Lady of Knock, as we carried out Ray's body from the church in Navan, a full church. He went home to his grandmother, and I'm sure they heard that song again, getting into glory, born again unto eternal life. At Knock it was the simple people who saw her. They didn't dispute, they just saw and believed, and it was enough. Oh, 